This is a production of Cornell University. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Class of 2011 MFA graduation reading. <laughs> Um, please turn off or silence all of your cell phones at this point. And um, before we get started, I'd like to uh, give some thank yous on behalf of the graduating class of 2011. Um, we've spent two years now sort of being supported and encouraged by the whole Cornell community, and I know we're all very grateful for that. So I wanted to thank, first of all, the um, faculty members who have taught our workshops, um, which is on the poetry side, Lyra Van Cleef Stefanen, Robert Morgan, Ken McLean, and Alice Fulton. And on the fiction side, uh, J. Robert Lennon, Ernesto Quinones, Stephanie Vaughn, and Stuart Onan, uh, who along with John Murillo was the distinguished visiting writer this semester. And teaching the workshop is usually not part of their duties. So Stuart um, stepped up and did that for us. And we're all very grateful that he was able to do that. Um, so the, the people who've been the directors of the creative writing program while we've been here have been Stephanie Vaughn and Elena Viramontes. So a special thanks to them for keeping everything running so smoothly. Um, other faculty members are Michael Cook, who as the editor of Epic is the best boss any of us will ever have in our entire lives, uh, and Maureen McCoy, who taught our last uh, Reading for Writers this semester, and our newest faculty member is Joni McCaskey, so big welcome to her. Um, so the faculty and uh, the students have, are supported by a really wonderful administrative staff, and we'd like to thank them as well. Um, Karen Kuje, the program coordinator who coordinates not only this reading, but all of the readings for the reading series throughout the year. Uh, Marianne Marsh, the administrative director. Michelle Manella, graduate coordinator. Um, Molly Kirker, who helped make the beautiful poster that advertised this reading. Um, Keith Daniels, Darlene Flint, and Vicki Brevetti. Um, then we've also been supported by the English department. Um, so Rick Bogle and Roger Gilbert are the co-chairs of that department. And they, along with Marianne Marsh, were instrumental in restoring the fourth year option of, for lectureships for MFA um, students. So sort of thanks to their efforts, we all have the chance to, to remain in Ithaca for another year and teach, which is a really wonderful opportunity. So we're very grateful for that. Um, we would also like to thank Mr. David Pickett, who is here in the audience today, um, whose generous contribution has allowed, um, allows all of the second year MFAs to basically be funded for the summer. So we can remain in Ithaca for the summer and revise our theses and work on publication. So that's just a fantastic opportunity and we're very grateful. Uh, and finally, we'd like to thank our parents, especially our moms, because it is almost Mother's Day. So parents and family and friends, thank you so much for your support. All right. <laughs> So without further ado, I'd like to begin by introducing our first reader. Um, but please hold your applause until the end of the reading. We do have eight readers coming up, so we want to keep things running very smoothly. So we'll have a final round of applause at the end. So our first reader, as Tacey M. Atsidi Dene from Cove, Arizona, is Sena Habilni and born for Tah Nizahni. She is a recipient of the Truman Capote Creative Writing Fellowship, the Corson Browning Poetry Prize, and Morning Star Creative Writing Award. She holds bachelor degrees from Brigham Young University uh, and the Institute of American Indian Arts. Her work has appeared in Florida Review, Drunken Boat, New Poets of the American West Anthology, and other publications. Her chapbook, Amenorrhea, came out in February 2009 by Counting Coup Press. Please welcome Tacey Essity. Everybody. <clears throat> Let's eat. Reach into your pocket. Fat wrapped in intestines is so stiff when cold. It looks like we shouldn't speak of such things so young. Instead, need salt, flour, and water in this bowl. These were our toys. I've tasted them, figurines of sheep herders or soldiers. Should they harden and be painted, and should a hole be blown from the insides, from the intestines, all that salt? Your baby brother, his intestines were broken. He couldn't pee, 
and he died because he was so full of pee. Just like your grandmother, that day she walked out of the Hogan, dropped to her knees, holding her stomach, so mixed up inside when it exploded. After all those explosions in Vietnam, it must have messed him up pretty good. He could never eat a chi again. He had to have three enemy ways done. We had to haul so many sheep. It's a long ride in the back of a jeep all the way to Farmington to be baptized. The Apache building, it was big and red, and I stood there next to that wall of bricks wearing my squash blossom, a line of females being down to the male, and there rested his tongue almost between my breasts. That brings it to me. I remember she who wasn't spoken of. Each red vine costed a nickel, that easy twine across the street from our little red brick house. They say she drove so fast, she turned into a whirl of smoke behind Table Mesa the day she died. Dad says he remembers the first time he died that long bus ride when they took him to Utah for school. He had been memorizing land formations. An angel the size of his hand disappeared. And after that, he was so empty from crying and so full of remembering rocks, he just fell asleep. He remembers stealing pennies from his foster sister to buy red licorice. He was always in trouble for that or for slingshotting the chickens. Only three survived the morning massacre. Only one sheep was stolen from the flock. They stole it. All those Navajo boys let it out to the base of the mountains and slit its throat. Laughing into the dry night, fat dripping from the sides of their mouths. So I was instructed to um, read short and read funny, and I don't write funny poetry, so <laughs> too bad for you all. Um, <laughs> <okay>. <clears throat> Mounted. I knew the word, sex, that it was private. On MTV, I had seen long-haired men point their guitars up and sing, she's my cherry pie. One morning, I found a cherry pie lying hogtied on the floor of sleep in her own urine. I knew my dad had been a bull rider, but hadn't known about him calf roping. I circled around her into my dad's room. That's Mary, he answered. Go fix breakfast while she sobers up. I walked out, stepped over her, and stood at the stove, pushing fat around, waiting for the salty smell of bacon to drown the house. Rain scald. <clears throat> when you've been standing in rain so long, you never, you no longer hear it or feel it falling. You believe it's stopped. Step away, look to your skin, muck itch. It's a shame your hands have gone bald from fungus, taking you to what's beneath scab, to one of those nights when you know your gums will bleed. To say it's been a while or that it has to do with wrist mange is to say it comes Rot comes so easily now, skin weep, lapse, step through the whole black of your home and still no damp, know exactly when to cup your finger for the light switch. So familiar in a bod, shame, your hands have gone haywire, taking you to what's beneath rust, ranges they've grazed, a time when you've combed through, when you know your knuckles and all that the rain has swallowed. Elegy for Yucca Fruit Woman. 
Without me, she said, go. I'm going to the rock that once had wings. My life rolls like rock clods, clumps fractured down a volcanic throat to the base of a neck, circle the tips of big winds beneath. Poised arms, long spanned wing bone, surrounded higher and closing, dust hinge wings in upstroke, a slow separation in landing or takeoff. To take air, those inward whooshes as if blessing oneself. That sound of marrow leaving the hollow, whistle breaths and fumes to the plats, to the gliding end. Pop. This woman knelt with woman filling the earth, mush in tin after tin, circle in the course she ran and filled in with the breaking sun. This woman's purse with sumac berries drying, kneeling down she'd flap dough at the wood pop, her hands whirring, the air bubbles rising with heat ready to Later, she'd send me to 7-Eleven, clenching dimes for. At two points, they say a man flew with a life feather, quill in hand from the top of Shiprock, down to the people having slain monster birds, plumes, and all their veins ending in flight, humming after the bird strike. A female eagle swooped east, she once told me. It was like gold whirring in the blue of my windshield. I was driving my truck listening to Yebache songs when it happened. After it happened, I had never seen so much dust. When skin slats layered like stone and collapses ripe with wrinkle, a red grows gray. Aspen expands to the hush of this cedar-filled room. When her neck grew heavy, she'd say, the music helps me press play. reader is Miss Megan Ko. Megan grew up in the Sonoran and Mojave deserts. She worked at the University of Arizona Poetry Center as a reader for Sonora Review and is currently an assistant editor at Epic Literary Magazine. Her fiction often explores the disassociation characters feel when placed into strange environments and how they reconcile with their surroundings. Please welcome Miss Ko. The duck pond is, oh, <laughs> is that better? The duck pond is under construction. Sebastian wakes at seven and heads to the duck pond by eight, his ritual for years of weekday mornings. But one Monday, the day he needs the duck pond the most, because on Mondays his boss insists that they lunch together in order to forge her ideal boss-employee relationship, which she promises will become a lifelong bond. Though Sebastian intends to leave accounting and do something, anything else, he will join the circus if he must, or scrape diapers from the insentient elderly. The ducks are gone. The duck pond is under construction, reads handwriting scrawled across a board blocking the arched stone entrance. Under construction, Sebastian thinks. What could that mean? Did the breadcrumb dispenser break when the child attempted to pay with a finger full of snot? Did a mob of dissatisfied ducks somehow destroy the mud embankment? Did a large couple sit on the bench to share a baker's dozen and collapse the wrought iron? Or perhaps, just maybe, were the remains of another poor pantyhose murder victim being scraped from the murky, duck-befouled bottom? At this moment, the ducks might be bobbing through bloody water, 
nibbling at strands of human hair, developing a taste for flesh. Sebastian investigates the perimeter, but the stone wall is impenetrable. He walks dejectedly to work. The newspaper headlines read, women of Coy County cease wearing pantyhose and possible clue to murder left on crotchless hose. As he weaves through pedestrians, a slapping follows him, the sound of webbed feet on concrete. The crowd is thick, but half a block back, he is almost certain he sees a mallard, his shiny green head peeking between chins, his yellow beak half open in defiance. Sebastian hurries, but the duck disappears in a flutter of pastel heels. Two minutes after Sebastian arrives at the office, a single room with two desks, his boss Charmaine throws open the door. The air saturates with the smell of laurel and yeast, which is an improvement since lately she's carried an aura of doctor's offices and something metallic. Veins navigate her legs. She's not wearing her normal sheer black nylons. Corpses have been troubling the city for two months, always discarded in different places, but always strangled by the victim's own pantyhose. Charmaine says, they had a booth at the mall where you could create your own scent. It specially fits my natural pheromones. You like it? Their desks make an L with each other, so that even when he stares straight ahead, he can still see Charmaine from the corner of his eye. The first thing she does each morning is Google her own name. Charmaine says, my little problem is clearing up nicely. For the past couple of months, she has been making veiled references to a womanly problem. During one lunch, she said, feel lucky you have a stick instead of a hole. Sebastian nearly coughed up his clam chowder. As he pokes numbers into spreadsheets, he thinks about Lurchie and Ben Ben and half pint Bethy, the ducks. Only around them do his silences feel comfortable. The day passes slowly in a Morse code conversation between their computers. At a quarter past one, Charmaine gathers her purse. We'll walk over to the wingtip, she says. As soon as they reach the sidewalk, Sebastian swears that he hears quacking. What's that, he says. Oh, do you like it? Charmaine's hand flies to her hair. I got highlights done. Her feathery haircut ruffles in the wind. He hears it again, a quacking. Afraid the ducks might be flying away, he looks into the sky. The sun blinds him, brands his retinas, so that when he glances at Charmaine, her face is dark. It's not his imagination. The quacking is louder at the restaurant's entrance. And then he sees the sign, Monday special, fresh roasted duck. Pasted below the words is a picture of a duck, its wings folded over themselves, its neck ended before the head. Inside, no one appears to have a duck on his plate. Sebastian says, how many specials do you think they sell in a day? It might not be crowded now, but this place is about to become popular, and we found it first. Charmaine stands beside her chair until he pulls it out. Red meat, that's what I need to replace all that iron I've lost. Do I seem pale? Sebastian soundlessly opens his mouth, a gesture that satisfies most of her questions. What did you do this weekend, she asks. I thought I had a date, but at the last minute it was canceled. If I hadn't checked my email before I ran out the door, I would have just sat there alone, waiting. Sebastian says, I like to sit alone. Could you imagine, poor me, all by myself with a red rose behind my ear. Tears shiver in her eyes. I'd already gotten dressed in my shortest skirt. I had to wear pantyhose. Sebastian glances around for help, but it seems now all the patrons are busy dissecting ducks, shredding meat from little bodies. Oh God, he says, thinking of the pond, they'll never survive. We will, my dear, Charmaine covers his hand. We'll make it, you and I. They eat while Charmaine discusses her 15 minutes of fame. Everyone's entitled to a full 15, she says. The murderer's last victim, the only one with fishnets, was a waitress at the restaurant where I was supposed to meet my date, and they did a news special there that very night. I should have been on camera. Sebastian can't eat. Everything bothers him, the air in his lungs, the nails on his fingers. He says, I tried to go to the duck pond today, but it was con under construction. At least, that was the excuse they gave. I didn't know there was a duck pond around here. Then again, I have no one to go with. Animals usually hate me. Of course there is, in Reed Park, behind the tennis court, inside the stone wall. It's the best place in the city. I'll show you. She dabs at her eyes. No one's ever shared his special place with me. After she pays the check, they walk to the pond's back entrance, also blocked and swaddled with orange tape. He says, you need to give me a boost. Why don't you give me a boost? I'm lighter, aren't I lighter? I can't, he says. I mean, you can't look. The problem is that there's a body. A body? You saw this morning? Charmaine's heels have sunk into the grass and her ankles tremble. 
Was she beautiful? The women he picks are always beautiful. He closes his eyes. You wouldn't want to see. The pantyhose matched the victim's skin perfectly so that it looked like a rope of her own flesh was wrapped around her neck. You're trying to protect me, she brushes his hand. This is a secret between us. He nods. It's a crime scene. I need to check what progress has been made. I will never understand men. She locks her fingers together and squats. With one foot on her knee, he grabs at the rough patches of concrete between the stones. His other foot lifts to her basketed hands and his behind swings into the side of her face. He pulls higher. A thousand, no, two thousand ducks mill about inside, their paunchy bodies stacked on top of one another. They cover the water. There is no sign of grass. The crumb dispenser is on its side, ransacked, and rogue mallards jubilantly snatch the last scraps of plant matter from each other's mouths. But the hens, beige and huddled, know enough to be scared. Charmaine, sweaty and pungent from struggling to hold him, says, what do you see? The ducks hear her. Their beaks turn to point at Sebastian. Their tongues emerge like sea anemones, hungry, beckoning. They surge closer. Now it's obvious. The hens were never scared. They were only anticipating his arrival. They want me, Sebastian says. He pushes off of Charmaine until he straddles the wall. The ducks mill beneath him, ready. I'm going in. Charmaine's doughy cheeks rise in astonishment. It's him. Oh, God, I knew he'd come for me. My throat squeezes shut in my sleep. He can smell me. At her screeches, the ducks rise in a wave of feathers, a giant moving mass that needs only its own momentum. They throw their wings forward and back, their beaks unhinged. Charmaine's arms heave up as if she's about to fly herself, but instead she turns and flees, her high heels still picketed in the grass. Police, she calls, his fleet is after me. She demands the media authorities, firemen, reporters. An undertone of triumph shades her panic. She looks like a damaged starlet escaping the paparazzi, a woman aware of glamour at even the direst moment. The ducks fled after her, leaving Sebastian alone with the pond's remains. The grass is trampled and uprooted. Brown sludge has replaced the clear blue water. He was mistaken to believe the ducks might want him. Lone feathers, the sieges of his former life, scatter here and there, their edges razor sharp in the afternoon sun and Sebastian drops to his feet on the wrong side of the wall. As he gathers them, he finds a particularly dense pile beside the shredded rosebush, but the pile is not only feathers. At the bottom crumples a lifeless hen, her raw eye riveted onto his own. Half-pint Bethy's slender neck twists like a strand of DNA, and on her pink breast only a few feathers remain. Beneath the water fountain, where she loved to stand so that the leaky pipe would drip atop her head, Sebastian digs his hands into the earth. All the funerals he will ever attend cannot compare to this one, where he is the sole mourner and the bouquets are made from down. <clears throat> Benjamin Garcia is originally from Albuquerque, New Mexico. He has received scholarships from Bread Loaf and Taos Writers Conferences. His first publication is forthcoming in the spring-summer issue of Poet Lore, and every time he writes a good poem, his hair grows a little longer. <laughs> Hi. Thank you for coming. Um, this first poem is entitled Communion. Communion. Each is broken in its own way. The unsalted crackers, I mean, that are, are not the host in metaphor. The splash of grape juice in a plastic shot glass. Money set on a plate. Eat, don't eat. I took the tiniest crumb. Drink, don't drink. I took the least filled cup. They don't mean to, but each in his, her own way, fucks you up. It is what it is, love. Stand, sit. I never could pray, but if you peeked, you could see my lips move. Um, this next one is entitled Le Daria Mis Pulmones, which in Spanish means I would give her my lungs. Toward the end, she could only lift a cup of coffee. Closer still, even that became too much for her, my grandmother. A sponge then, I dip in coffee or dip sweet bread and put that to her lips to suck. That was all the cancer let her manage. The IV was her sugar water and she, the hummingbird she loved to watch, busy at the red and yellow feeder. 
those plastic flowers welded on were poor excuses, but they worked. Whatever worked, I guess, my grandma thought, lived on the bed in the living room, her body of sleeping birds, her dream of a thousand green wings shimmering like shreds of aluminum that could at any moment unloose on the wind. Toward the end, the sponge and the coffee, the cancer. She couldn't smoke anymore either, of course, because even pulling in her own drag, impossible. So she had me smoke for her, nine years old. I was her lungs. I blew the smoke right in her face, right in her face, just like that, over and over. Um, this next one is, um, I guess, a paraphrase from um, a passage in the Quran. Who is the most important person in your life? Your mother, your mother, your mother. I used to believe she loved me. Of course she loved me. Of course she loved me. Her son. I just assumed until one day mi madre told me a story when I was old enough, but not too old, at a time when one is not yet filled with hate. She said, may la Santísima Madre forgive me, but in those first days, before you even had a name, and the neighbors called you Walter after our street, ay madre, what an ugly name, that in those first days, a darkness took her away from herself. Nube gris come on a wind, todo le valía madre. She was pinning my washed diapers on the line. I cried inconsolably. In a bolt, it crossed her mind to grab me, hijo de tu jodida madre at the ankles and dash me against the chain link fence again and again until the ghost of dust in me shook off in la madre as from a dirty tarp and I was clean. But frightened of herself, she took me to the neighbor and left me there, amor de madre. If I forget, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth like a spade in thick clay y que me partan bien la madre. I used to believe blindly she loved me. Now I know the truth. Favorite, youngest born, the right hand son, un des madre. Um, the next one is papaya, and they kind of smell, um, but they're delicious. Papaya. If the best disinfectant is sunshine, this fruit is the sun, drowning in the Pacific, persimmon like. Kiss cousin of the quince, it's rot before it's ripe. Clothe it in yesterday's paper like a butcher's sack. The outside needs to fuzz a little, and if it dimples, even better. Bruising is normal, I had forgotten. A bag of green apples turned to mush by its own miasma. Inside this fruit, the eyes of flies or the eggs of a toad. It doesn't take a scalpel, you know, just a scoop. A scrape, great. Do you ever feel guilty? Why, I'm not the father, he said. A mouth so shut, it's golden. Animals in nature both wear this color to court and as a disclaimer, don't fuck with me, fuck me. Don't put any sugar on it, don't. Because if flesh tastes so much like bloody chicken, why don't you just go eat chicken then, scab? Leave it alone. Ever since you said the kitchen smells like baby shit, I can't smell anything else. Um, and this next one is, um, a horse is not a window. A horse is not a window, once someone told me, shoving me away from the television set. And on television, seeing the horse I would become, a horse with a hole in its neck. If I doubted human cruelty, a voice said, I could thrust my whole hand through it. I have, in anger, punched through a window, and because it is impolite to make a piñata in the shape of a human, I have, I admit, bashed a horse in, hung on a limb with a broomstick, for a few cubes of candy or a turn at the salt lick, ghost and the spooked horse that broke my grandfather's neck, and my uncle yelling at the horse to stop, and the horse ignoring him, the lips bloodied by the metal at his teeth, and the neighbor boy in a wife beater chasing a colt in circles in his yard, even after he grabbed hold of the reins, circles. And the boy who called me horse, which I loved until I became his horse. 
I refuse the ease of a baled hole come evening and all the repuglia of a stable. This bang tail won't be bridled. If I give cadence, it is mixed with the muck my shoes took up in getting here. I am familiar with the violence of a hammer. Impurity makes sense now, as Mustang comes from the word mestizo. Another word for my people is wanderers. It means we can't be happy where we are. But I swear, mijito, we're almost there. My mother would spit this Sunday mornings, block after block, before I was witness. I still wanted to finish the jigsaw from which I knew there were a few pieces missing. It didn't, it, and it wouldn't ever look like the picture. I just wanted a little patch of vacant sky pitched above some aster, a meteor shower. When did I become this horse in pasture, blade in the apple, like an awkwardness I have grown into? The stars come out, fall out, flicked off God's costume. All around the abscess, the flesh healed cleanly, but the tissue wept left an absence, more gibbous than crescent. It shows no visible hindrance. If a twitch so small scares you off, you must not want it badly enough. If it aches, it aches. You are so spook, as if the wrought iron of me would brand you, as if I would lend you that. I got in my car and drove until I found horses. I stayed until they became part of the landscape, until there wasn't a star at my window. So our next reader is Rachel Coy. She is incredibly humble and a great friend and writer. Um, she's originally from upstate New York, and she writes fiction. Rachel Coy. Hey friends. <laughs> so um, I'm going to read the first half of a story. Uh, it's called Tuck Tuck. The boys want, am I okay? Can you hear me? Is that right? This way? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> the boys want me to push them on the swing. No one has shoes on. They want tortillas stuffed with hot dog pieces and tablespoons of cold butter for lunch, for dinner. Everything melts together. They want me to draw a house. They want me to draw their family. Their heads and fingers and feet are always too close to my face. It feels nice. They smell warm and healthy like oatmeal, maybe warm and a little dirty, like when you turn on the heat for the first time in October. They're good. They have hot dog breath. When I tell them it's time for sleep, they don't scream. I watch them brush their teeth. I say, get the back. They try harder. The white tiled walls are rosy in the light. Later, I check on them. They are the same size and only a year apart. Riley sleeps like a cat about to jump on you, but with his face turned to the side. His navy sheets show the accumulation of several days of drool stains. It makes me think about the salty waves near the bottom of my winter pants. Jake sleeps in the shape of a star. He's always tugging at the neck of his pajama top. In the early morning, he will wake up sweaty, red-cheeked, and smelling of microwaved milk. I clean the kitchen. I move things around in the refrigerator. I eat leftover spaghetti with a spoon. When all there is to hear is the house settling, I dip my limbs, one at a time, in the plastic wading pool by the patio. Everyone has outgrown it. I crawl around in the sandbox. Both are wet and full of bugs. The sand sticks to the back of my shorts, the back of my legs, and the top of my head. I try to brush it off, but it just turns to mud. In the morning, Rose comes home. She works three 12-hour shifts a week at the hospital, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Every third week, she takes the overnights. These mornings, she brings in that dull, claustrophobic stench that hangs around every hospital waiting room, starch and canned peaches. The boys are awake to greet her, panting, with partially chewed cereal dripping off their chins onto linoleum. <laughs> I've been pra for practicing that. <laughs> I don't know when she sleeps. Do I smell like weed, she whispers. I laugh. Toast falls on the floor. There's jam, too. Someone cries. 
The dog appears for the first time in days, eats the toast and the chewed cereal, starts licking toes. We take turns giggling. Rose palms me a joint. I leave out the back door. It's only warm in the sun. My sister Sylvie lives eight blocks away, six north, two west. From the sidewalk, the front of the house looks like a face. The awning over the front door is a red nose. From the upstairs, if one of the upstairs windows is open, it looks like a wink. Half a year ago, I moved into her guest bedroom, the left eye. The kitchen is decorated with country crafts, punched tin stars, an old peanut butter pail for wooden spoons, and a glass jar with a handle for crushing beans. Sylvie owns a bar and grill downtown. Most nights, she brings home a garbage plate for me and a styrofoam takeout container. The one waiting in the refrigerator, fried beans, baked bean, fried ham, baked beans, macaroni salad, and spicy mustard. Condensation drips down the lid and mixes with the beans. I eat everything cold. Sylvie comes into the kitchen wearing a pink thong and a Bruce Springsteen t-shirt. This is normal. She lights the burner with a match and mimics the gas clicks with her tongue. Her eyes are still dark, swollen, and tender in the morning light. She doesn't want to talk yet. Sylvie and Rose went to high school together. I knew them as beautiful teenagers, tanning on beach blankets on her back deck, all legs and ponytails. When I was nine, they let me sleep between them in a backyard tent while they cried and laughed off and on all night. Hard, sharp rocks poked my back and pushed into my dreams. It made sense then. When I was 14, they took me to a party and let me get drunk on plastic cupfuls of keg beer and then slept on my bedroom floor so I wouldn't choke on my own vomit in the middle of the night. It's uncomfortable to be in the same room with them. They talk through 20 years of inside jokes. Think sand art, tiny layered memories that fill up a plastic bottle shaped like a wizard or a dolphin. Sylvie leaves the room and comes back wearing an oversized chambray shirt, black jeans, and white tennis shoes. She smells like honey and sunscreen. Cupboards open and shut. Coffee is poured into big white bowls. She holds hers with both hands and leans against the island. How was last night, I say. Fine, busy. I broke up a fight about a girl. I didn't know people still fought over girls, she says. Tommy, her husband, walks in. Tommy is a soft-spoken cartoon bear. He shuffles around the house and stretched out 50-50 shirts, fixing things that aren't really broken, gaps in the crown molding, dark spots on the garage floor. Usually, he's too shy to say hi. I look around. Everything is very, very clean. There are unlit candles everywhere. I smell like onions and mayonnaise. The cotton in his shirt has washed out over time, making it almost see-through. I stare at his chest hair until Sylvie interrupts. How's Rosie, she asks. Tommy sips some of her coffee. She rubs his shoulders and bumps her hip into his. They've been in love like that for years. You know, tired, I say. Later, we walk the two blocks east and six blocks south to Rosie's house. There are parts of the yard that stay wet for weeks. Past the clothesline is a stomped out patch with a soccer goal. One of the kids twisted together dozens of dandelions and wrapped them around the metal frame. They are rotten and mushy. I wonder how long they will stay like that. We have a casserole. Sylvie loves making things that fit into Pyrex dishes. Today, it's the light blue snowflake motif filled with eggs and spinach and yellow cheese. The contrast is distracting. Steam clouds the lid. I try to walk straight back to avoid her telling me that I should do yoga. I ring the doorbell. For a second, everyone is waiting. When I was 18 and Sylvie was 22, our mother met a man on the internet and moved to Orlando. His name was Dave, and he lived in a condo community called Oceanside Villas that had a pool shaped like a, a guitar. Everyone was retired. We ate shrimp that my mother didn't defrost all the way. It was raining, but I wanted to go to the beach. There was no beach. I ate fingered scoops of horseradish until my eyes warmed up and leaked. The four of us just sat there. Tears ran down my face. My mother said, what is wrong with you? I still don't know if she was concerned or upset. We stayed at a hotel, and I tried to make it okay. But Sylvie missed Tommy. 
They were engaged then. She talked to him in the bathroom with the door closed, and I could only hear her squeal once in a while. I wanted to hear more. We walked down to the lobby bar, and I tried to get someone to play the piano for us. Some guy asked what he should play, and I said, the piano man. Nothing happened. Sylvie bought me a cocktail. <laughs> Sylvie bought me a cocktail that tasted like melted chocolate ice cream. We ordered three more. What is mom doing here, I asked. Is it fun or funny? I don't know, Sylvie said. It's not as funny as it should be. She slept with her hands above her head, like a forever fo frozen sports fan in an ill-timed photo. Eyes closed, doing the wave, everything slightly off center. Our last night, we went out for barbecue. Everyone got ribs and cornbread, thick slices of apple pie with American cheese melted on top, giant cups of too sweet lemonade that made my teeth ache. No one wanted to talk. My throat closed up, started to refuse food. The check came. Sylvie and I paid. We left a cash tip, but Dave told us it was too much and took $3 off the top of the pile. We said it was fine just to leave it. He might have, but he might have put it in his pocket. I have memories for both scenarios. I couldn't tell. I still don't know. Our next reader is uh, Clayton Piddick, a poet from Pittsburgh, PA. He's a graduate of Duquesne University and uh, he spent three summers at the New York State um, Writers Institute in Saratoga Springs. He's currently working on his poetry thesis. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Spring evening, I have arrived by detour. The town's biggest loser is the shopping plaza, and I'm sitting across from it, stuffing my face with churned out happy, pushed through a window. The signs for the greeting card store, chiropractor and salon, the curl up and die, are the conjoined hooligans of night. They like to break stairs by blinking first. This plaza shares, uh, shares an entry with above ground pool in any thesaurus. They harbor the same pathetic idea of fun. The salon's globes levitate in the dark, above cushions, projecting some knowledge of geography I have not yet learned. And it will be raining on the drive home. Motorcycle memorials bloom on the guardrails, and they are the par par parrots of the motorways, reciting to us names of friends and producing the sounds gone from our nestic vocal cords. This larynx backsteps behind foliage. This smile is a congealed fixture. Okay, and this one is called Drinks. The neons are waterlogged and loitering in groups on the table, committing to a standstill promenade in the jump of nervous flame. The inflated Jolly Ranchers are swaying heavy-headed between first-date nonsense on their peg legs. The crescents of fruit they are attempting to drown hoist themselves out of the ice, huffing and puffing like failed first swimmers at the rims. I fail to detect their foreboding, flay belly, belly aching. I only catch the fact that they take a creative part in a charades game, teaming up with the glass to make the letter Q before the buzzer sounds. I look to you after surveying this board game, boasting no rules and burnt manuals, and realize we have, be we have been outdone by stemware. Our sight, I realize, has been cloned without our consent, and sets of our mouths open and close at one another throughout the restaurant. While all around us, we, play, we, we pray in unison for the buzzer to sound. <laughs> okay. Um, and this is this is a Florida poem called um, Benthos, a Dania Beach chandelier. 
Inside, the glitz and glam of some treasure chest chem lab rotates, but does so without noise, without making itself a guest or the centerpiece of conversation. This molecular bonding model goes wild above our heads. Television monitors, televisions monitor silently the bartender who rubs empty sockets with a cloth while an ailing field of baldness made moonlike on his crown brightens and dims. I look at you in the space of time where wine glasses and high hills slide into hybrid things. Our scene, haloed and apricot, becomes the abyssal lantern for some unknown hunter. This season. I mouth the past weekend to myself in disbelief of the eyes my rear view proffers. I pass a frozen pond sandwiched by three crosses and a sliding board. I see myself padding between them in my shoes the magnitude of parties stuck speechless on my souls. I feel the strain of the umbrellas turned inside out, the pterodactyl wings inverted above our heads. I see a man sitting on a chassis at an intersection. The rest of his ride is a bedsheet unmoored from the clothesline. This season catches us both in a stare and demands cauterize the flanks. I cheer for the brain damage exchanged between two men on a lobby television. I think of the table for two, the stranger emitted from my mouth, and how impossible it is to dry two hands with cocktail napkins. Canvas Twilight. She spoke to me, of course, only because she thought I was the pizza man. <laughs> In fact, there was no car, no pizza, and nothing in the world that linked us. She gazed at me, running a crude comb of taste buds through her mustache. I wrapped my arm around the neck of her huffy basketball hoop, attempting to convey to it in the backed up wells of above ground pools, our common ground. I gathered them all in sight, begging for kin, while an apology crumbled through my teeth like terracotta. My language was PVC and panes, veneer and vinyl, and my cologne had the plastic hint of sample catalogs. And leaving, I convinced myself I should have had a pizza ready for her. <laughs> and, and I reeled to the back of my throat all of the exaggerations of our so-so siding, roofing, and soffit and fascia. The dogs barked, the pools weighed, and the heels and wingtips clicked to the doors. The sun, my steed, carried me out of town. Okay. Uh, the Wee Hours Marathon, and this is about um, a black bear that I almost hit in Pennsylvania. The Wee Hours Marathon. It was late and I was far enough from home that my cell phone's face kept insisting it was sorry. The bear ran out in front of my car, rushing for the guardrail like it was finish line tape. This was the wee hours marathon, and the black bear finished first. In the bald flash of my headlights, he looked like the bear the toddler painted, the one that didn't look like a bear. I guess my car was a camera, and the only record I had of the event was my tall tales. Back in town, I was a faulty roll of film, unraveling my mouth for anyone. Hungry. Wild barks from a pack of stray dogs barge into a beach community and glance off the buildings all day. By nightfall, the sound escapes its pinball trap, and we overtake the pack in our vehicle whose doors scream at our sides. Every action tonight will stray from the glint on my eyes. Breath will bury me. Save me, valet, from the ballet of the heavy-footed. My smile is a sputtering gift shop front. Somewhere miles from here, a wintertime fly crawls like a fleck of basement across safety orange. Out of the dimension between panes, this time travel tranquilizes 
what once boiled and ricocheted at a picnic. We trail city label flagella on a map and slide over a crease. I am only asking for sleep. Okay, and <clears throat> I'm gonna end with a, a Florida poem called Panhandle Delirium. This place is a million post-it notes flapping in an ocean breeze. Left by some unseen giants, they plague the mangrove as though it's a refrigerator. I cannot make out the highway billboards any longer. My pupils try to find right side up, like the sides of icosahedron die, who are drunk from the blue of an eight ball. As the eyes finally position themselves, they are directed toward the road, which is sucked into the fender like the long, glossed tongue of the receipt spool, where cash register hiccups like the cocking of a gun. My present day scroll, riddled with dollar signs and decimals. When I am in the jacuzzi of civilization, I seem to somewhat recall a dream of nudity in which the world lay stark in front of me on its sofa of night, in its soiree of smoke, in which the trees were spread out as a field of x-rays, in which phalanges rose in injured forms. The highway paint begins to read, we wish you a very safe and happy holiday season. And I flip through 20 faces. Okay, um, I'm now gonna introduce my friend Christian Howard. Um, Christian was born and raised in Buffalo, New York. He spent much of his childhood soliciting free merchandise from companies by writing form letters under various personae. To date, he has received crates of soft drinks, a trip to the Bahamas, free clothing, jewelry, a signed letter from Socks, Bill Clinton's cat, <laughs> and certificates for everything from cases of wine to several one-month supplies of Snapple. Um, Christian holds an AB from University of Miami in Coral Gables, Florida. And uh, please welcome Christian. So, uh, can you guys hear me? Is that good? All right. Um, I'll be reading from something new. Uh, it's brand new. Um, tentatively calling it a history of cartography. When people asked why he traveled with so many children, Uncle Alvin, as he asked to be called, offered up a question in return. And why not, he'd say. The more pure voices there are, the better to drive the demons away. There were only so many souls left worthy of true salvation, and it was his job to find them, which he would. And the children would exercise them of evil, take away their sins, and lead them to the light. On long car trips like this one, trips that took days, even if Uncle Alvin knew where he was going, Felix preferred to sleep on the floor. At 16, he was the eldest of the children, and Alvin had spent the summer preparing him for death. Uncle Alvin says that, that though he cannot grant immortality, only he can give you that, he says. What he can offer is salvation. It'll come, he says. Death is sure as the sun and moon. But don't you worry none about that. Soon you'll learn and you'll preach it to the others the way I've been preaching it to you. A day or so later, he'd taken it up again, saying, oh, oh, I do not envy you, son. Be prepared. It's only worse from here on in. <laughs> By the way the trees stood tall and rigid, packed as sardines, Felix could tell they were somewhere in the north. The other children were sleeping, but he could hear them, the youngest ones sputtering and making wet noises in their dreams. Without even opening his eyes, he could tell it was still too early for the sun to be up. But his body had been trained to wake at the same time each morning and take over the driving for Uncle Alvin. He rocked himself gently left and right, telling each part of his body, from his toes to his feet, ankles to calves, knees to thighs, to back to chest, arms to eyes to mind, to wake up. Today, there were souls to save. Up front, Uncle Alvin was only half awake, pinching the papery skin below his eyes every once in a while to keep himself alert. He was not swerving, not yet, though the van, big enough on the road to frighten other drivers even when it was steady, shook a bit in the strong morning wind. Felix took the passenger seat, said good morning. Uncle Alvin reached into his pocket and pulled out a tangle of fabric, something that looked like a shoelace with two small cloth squares anchoring each side. You take this, he said, for your birthday. 
In the light that came with the passing of other cars, the fabric shone a deep roasted color, soft and woolly in ways, coarse in others. You put it on once and only once, Uncle Alvin said. What do you mean, Felix said. He rolled the... Pl- He rolled the rope of it between his fingers, tried his best to read the writing in the thick blackness inside the van. But the letters were too small, and in the dark he could only see a figure in flames on one square, a heart on the other. Stretched out, the necklace was long, about the length of his arm. You put it on, you hear me, and never take it off. Not in the shower, not in the pool, not when you're out working either. If it breaks, you tell me, and we'll get a new one. If you stay true to yourself, stay righteous, you'll be fine, he said. That there, that's just insurance. He and Uncle Alvin took turns driving, Felix going no faster than 60 miles an hour. He'd only just gotten his license, though he'd been driving cross-country for years without incident. The whirring of the wheels and ticking off of the undercarriage pulled his mind through the bottom of the van's stained carpeting and metal floor into a place where he felt safe and warmed and full of the Lord. As the sun rose up and green edges of the interstate took on a character that had gone flat during the night, Felix realized they had not stopped for nearly a day. Uncle Alvin telling the children to use the plastic urinal bottle that that had appeared suddenly after a visit to a retirement home in Cleveland. (laughs) Ruth complained that she didn't know how, and Uncle Alvin tossed her a funnel and said, you just be real careful, hon. (laughs) The other children were complaining, too. Ava complained that her clothing smelled now that she'd slept in them the night before. Little Ruthie, only eight, hair pulled up on her head so sharp she looked like a tanned unicorn, was certain there were bugs in her ears since she'd had to sleep next to the cracked window. A moth, she said. I just hear it flapping its wings. The children begged for a stop, at least to get out and stretch their legs before breakfast. Uncle Alvin thought it would be a good time to check a map, regain their bearings, and figure out which church they'd ask for shelter. He told Felix to pull off at the next ramp find a quiet street, and park. A dog was barking. Somewhere, Felix heard music, or what sounded like the coming of rain. At the corner, four men had gathered on an open porch, drinking. Withered brown men on wooden stools and fold-out lawn chairs, shaking their fists at one another, loudly threatening death one minute, brotherhood the next, their voices rubbing against each other in rough, half-hearted attempts to make peace with the unknown. Two houses over, A woman walked by her window, carrying twins, one on each shoulder, bouncing them up and down for comfort. Two little girls, Felix thought. He recognized the squealing, like wild geese caught fire. And when the woman moved out of sight, he thought the sounds bouncing off walls and twisting in their strained travel toward him had turned to something else, something softer, or some other sound entirely different, a television, perhaps, left alone, left to its own vanity, maybe. Somewhere, the music carried on, marking time in its way. A man was mowing his lawn, because that was what people did each weekend when the weather was fair. The trees were nearly undone by then, and what remained looked like fire or earth or rot. What was left was grotesque, wet confetti, carving the lawn into perfect geometric form. The minotaur's maze, Felix joked to himself. The dog was barking, and no one noticed except for Felix. In the van, Uncle Alvin had misplaced their directions, so the family was searching for a folded piece of paper among a mobile universe of folded pieces of paper. Is this it, Ava said? There were maps of New Mexico, of California, Georgia, Virginia, and glory be, I will not rest until I know where we are exactly, Uncle Alvin said. The maps of Pennsylvania and Ohio had been badly maintained. Parts of them gone missing, other parts had obviously been chewed. The North, Uncle Alvin, we are definitely in the North. Ruthie pulled her finger from her nose and rubbed the ring of the cigarette lighter. I found something, she said, but no one bothered to look. Except for Felix, they were all inside the van. Still early, this Felix's birthday, he felt full of something, warmed inside, thinking of finding just one person happy to listen to the gospel. In the confusion, he had taken off toward the house across the street with his bag full of Bibles. Not the house with the men outside or the babies in. Not the lawn maze in wait for a sacrifice. Not the house where the dog lived. Or, but the house where the dog lived. Sorry, that's a crucial point. Uh, But the house where the dog lived. The dog that was still barking. All the doors in the house were closed, so no one answered when Felix knocked. Upstairs, the owners were trying several things they'd never done before. It was a Sunday, early enough to curry favor with the divine, and they were not the types to go to church. In the light that fell through the curtains, almost brown in its soapy marbled cast, the bedroom had begun to look swollen and irritated. Felix knocked again, harder. 
Don't even blink, the wife was saying to her husband. Don't you fucking dare. There were others there with them, several, in fact. No one moved, except for Felix. He pushed the Bible back into his bag, pulled out a pamphlet on repentance and salvation, and slipped it in between the black, faux-wrought iron flowers that wound snake-like at the front of the storm door. The dog was hurling itself at the gate, barking. Felix knew nothing of dogs. This one was white. The word boxer came to mind, though Felix wasn't sure what it meant or who had put it there, or how to divine its meaning. Mysterious ways, he thought. He had nothing in his bag that a dog might want, so he offered so he offered it what warmth his hand might bring. He knew nothing of dogs, so its speed overwhelmed him, took by surprise the arm still weighed heavy with the bag of Bibles, and made of it the top portion of a well, a beam on which a heavy, reckless weight pulled down. Somewhere there was music and the low vibrations of a lawnmower, all of it filling a space inside of Felix that hollowed out in the moments that followed. In the time it took for the dog's teeth to catch at the knuckle, and the rough pull and snap of one, of two, there was a closing inside of Felix, and then an opening up again, wide and bright and blinding, that tore him in two, then knitted him up again with something nesting deep inside, something that fluttered like a bothered garment struck up to dry, something that had been cracked with the slow melt and regression of ageless seasons, and Felix, numbed by shock and by pain, by confusion and the greasy knowledge that in nature the message of necessity would never change, only the means of conveying it. He saw what could only be described as a light, and though he felt himself pulling against teeth, pulling himself apart, he felt nothing, heard nothing, saw only light, white and hot and humming, with a song that was suddenly and irreversibly and unmistakably the end and the beginning and end all at once. Um, so I'm going to uh, welcome Beth Rogers to the stage. Um, I met Beth very, very early upon coming here. Beth was, I think, the only person to successfully friend every single new MFA on Facebook. Um, and we had dinner a few days or a day before orientation. Um, and at that dinner, I think we decided that we would one day run away and start a jug and spoon band. So before Beth and I get famous and you see us all over YouTube, um, I'd like to welcome Beth Rogers. Okay, my first poem um, is about Galileo's father. Um, he was a lute player as well as a composer and a music theorist. And this poem is called Margin Error. The numbers always failed when forced with heaven's weight, absolute, holy. What about the gut and its unknown flaws? If an octave is perfect, then why the fifth impure? Galilei picks up where Pythagoras tossed his hammer to the sand, having sketched the first crude ratios from a water glass and a row of bells. But what is rational in day by night is spun back to question. And so in the dim of his studio, Galilei's work is all refrain. Again with ballast, he ties and plucks, asks God to foil muteness. Squaring weights, two to four, three to nine, the intervals pronounce just as they slip, their dissonance slight as heartbeat. Poised with pen, he stutters through the figure. This ratio of tension and octave, not in fact, Pythagorean two to one, but more abstruse, varying with the square root, but also instinct, sonority, a capricious code, cast, recast in human form. He stirs in his chair, what note he thinks is not played tremblingly, or untunes from bloating wood, it's summer, the Arno hisses. A rough watermark, this new equation, one of nearly, almost, chaos. 
Despite the late hour, it seems noisy in this house and every house. Walls echo with the children's arguments, scratching pins, the squeak of their compass. So unsettled, all of them, stirring nights with their questions, and awake again before dawn, already thumbing at lutes. Um, I spent two years uh, living in rural China before I came to Cornell. Um, and most of my poems about China are about the experience of learning Mandarin, which I found quite difficult and humbling. Um, this poem contains a Chinese character. Um, it's pronounced Bai. It looks like this. Um, and it means uh, white. And I was surprised to discover when I was in China that a number of the lotions and, and soaps and so on um, had bleaching agents that promised to whiten your skin, um, which I found really bizarre. Um, so I, I guess this is a poem to sort of challenge that notion of whiteness as beauty. Um, in the poem, I reference Queen Elizabeth, uh, who used to paint her face with white lead in the later part of her life. Elizabeth, Shanxi Province, 2008. Cerus, white lead, known spirit of Saturn. After smallpox, her morning ritual, cloth and egg, self-portrait. Half passed in a tiled room, undressed for three minutes, a fleeting scald. My red hair breaking off in my own pale hand. Like the queen, my students said, but should have recanted once they saw me still illiterate at the market, looking for the body wash without buy. Fair, unblemished, sands bleach in the bottle. All summer, we ate cream, not named vanilla, but buy. And in shade, I asked why trees were painted white on their bottom halves. To protect against disease, the rough translation for what I took. Crouched eating, our heels touched anemic roots. Mouth with a chemical aftertaste, I went inside before I burned. Beauty without substance, a lover once called me in a rage. Best how I heard my name before the practiced forced. Um, last summer, uh, I got a grant from the graduate school to go back to China, so thank you, graduate school. Um, and while I was there, I got to visit the Xinjiang region of China. Um, this poem I wrote after visiting a, a 13th century, uh, or the ruins of a 13th century castle. Um, and it's very close to the Chinese border with Pakistan, way up in the mountains. So this poem is called At the Fortress. The upslope flecked with stray camels, earthen domes. Alone, I passed Tajik tombs, emptied hives, no sound. Rock and sand shifted hues, rust, amber, ash to white. A snowstorm left behind like an unwound gauze or geist. And then the break to Alpine, where lakes like organs gasp their blue. Inside this lofted wreck, what is said to be a fortress, I think somehow in rooms, my steps mark through dimensions. Here I feel the threshold, and then a ward facing west, a watch towards what might loom, whether horde or storm. Already could I know this place. If you were here, would you? Why else now 
with this arc towards violence across me. Looking out on what should be blithe, sod, a lamb-dotted moorland, I read fear in palm ears, the tops parched and tied in cloud. Who is to say what remembrance is, if just that any fable, real or imagined, would be painted like this? The stream, clear as looking glass, stones forced into labyrinth, a bridge over the moat. I can say watchtower and guess the first thing that fell, but by now do we want to know anything more of fray? Whether I took your arrow or ate figs out of your hand, what is left, teeth and molder to the crinal? Is it more than wind that instructs, tells me when to cover my head? Bleat, the warning now, across the open grass, so wide I couldn't tell you where the sound began. But how that vowel comes at me, undiluted, almost human, I bend, want to recant. But voice draws me in its augmenting room. I thrum against the charge. Here, wound in the throat, air, the column slits. It is my pleasure to introduce the last reader, Laurel Lathrop. Uh, Laurel grew up in California. She graduated from Princeton in 2008 with a degree in comparative literature and creative writing. Um, she also spent a year teaching in Singapore before coming to Cornell. Um, in addition to being a fiction writer as Laurel's friend, I know she's also skilled in some other areas, um, tart making, uh, cocktail mixing, event planning, uh, teaching freshmen, and sporting um, an immaculate blunt Parisian bob. Um, she's been really instrumental in the planning of this reading, so we all are very grateful to her. And it's my honor to introduce my good friend, Laurel Lather. Tariq was my little brother's name. When I met him, I thought it didn't fit. Such a tough name for such a soft little boy. All chubby arms and little boobs showing through his t-shirt and a beat up backpack full of comic books. He looked sickly, not full and happy like most fat kids I knew. His skin was a sort of blotchy and faded brown, and these purple circles under his eyes. Looking at those sad eyes, I knew right away he'd be trouble for me. Still, I helped him get settled, walking him to his first day of junior high, even though the high school was in the other direction, getting him to tell me his favorite food so I could ask Mrs. B to make it for his birthday, which was only a few weeks after he arrived. Pork chops he said, looking up at me with a little fat kid sparkle in his eye. And Mrs. B said she'd see what she could do. So on his birthday at dinner time, there was a big shiny balloon with Spider-Man on it tied to his chair. And Mrs. B brought out the pork chops and served him first. And Tariq started to cry. They weren't even cooked right. They had little burn pieces flaking off and were raw in the middle. But there he was, blubbering away at the kitchen table. Mrs. B put the platter down and patted his shoulder, and he said, all stuttery, Thank you, Mrs. B. This is the best birthday I ever had. And she told him to call her mama. I'd warned him when he first got here that she would say that, but he didn't have to call anybody anything he didn't want to. I said I'd call her Mrs. B for four years now, and I didn't intend to start calling her mama now. I had a mama, I said, and so did he. And just because Mrs. B couldn't have her own kids didn't mean she got to claim other people's. It's not a damn lost or found, I said. My mama's dead, he said. Shit, I knew that, I said, though I didn't until right then. She could have been in prison or on drugs or just plain crazy. There had been kids in the house with all of those problems, and there had also been kids who made it sound like they had no reason to be there at all. Usually after school, I'd walk to the mall with my best friend Ronnie and our other friend Gracie, and we'd get Orange Julius and look at jewelry and CDs. Gracie was Boricua, and Ronnie was black, and sometimes people called us Variety Pack. And once, two years ago, in seventh grade, an old man in a gray felt hat and round tinted glasses stood in front of us on the sidewalk and said, ooh, I never could decide between white chocolate, dark chocolate, or milk. Later, we decided that would make Asians caramel, even though Gracie thought she should get to be caramel. But I never once complained about white chocolate not even being chocolate. 
I had friends, is what I'm saying, and I didn't need a sad-eyed seventh grader trailing me around. So after I got him his birthday pork chops and made sure he knew he could come to me for anything serious, I pretty much left Tariq alone. That seemed fine with him. Mostly he stayed in his room with the door closed, reading comics and eating Doritos. Ronnie and Gracie would say hi to him and pretend to flirt when they came over, and he'd blush and go back to his room. I didn't call him my little brother then. Even if I'd wanted to, it would have been a bad idea, because you can never be sure how long someone will stay. Sometimes it was just a few weeks. I read somewhere that the average length of time a kid spends in foster care is 11 months, but I can tell you it's usually a lot less or a lot more than that, which is why I think averages are useless in general. It had been this way for weeks with no problems when Tariq came and stood in the bathroom doorway while I was blow drying my hair before school. I'll be done in a couple minutes if you need to take a piss, I said, but he just stood there looking at my reflection in the mirror. You got hair like corn silk, he said, kind of mumbly. The fuck is corn silk, I said, and he blushed and went back to his room. Secretly, I liked how it sounded. That summer, when he got me started with comic books, there was, I'd see the caption that described a big tittied girl with yellow hair as having hair like corn silk. Obviously, it was supposed to be a poetic way of saying blonde, which I wasn't, but Tariq thought it meant straight, and he thought that was pretty. I didn't mind it. I mean, I didn't think he was jerking off to my hair late at night or anything. I was starting to realize that everybody had something they liked better on somebody else. Like last year, Gracie show up, showed up to school one day wearing blue contacts. They must have been cheap as hell because they made the whites of her eyes all red. They didn't make her look white. They made her look like an alien. That's some children of the corn shit, Ronnie had said. <laughs> and I laughed, even though she had to explain the reference to me. Ronnie knew all about movies. She'd stay up all night watching horror movies on the TV while her grandma was passed out. Meanwhile, if I could trade any part of myself for any part of somebody else, I would choose Ronnie's skin, not that I would ever have said that to her. Her collarbone stood out from her chest like a smooth shelf you could run your finger along and not pick up any dust, and on the day she moisturized, the skin there had a sheen to it. When she got pregnant senior year of high school, Gracie and I spent the whole day at the Salvation Army picking out the nicest, newest baby clothes, pajamas with little daisies on them, and pink and yellow socks you could slip on over two fingers and then went to the laundromat and washed everything so they'd smell fresh when we gave them to her. Then on my own, I took the bus across town to the nice mall and got her a big tub, of, big tub of shea butter body cream at the body shop. When she opened the baby clothes, she just pressed her lips together. But when she opened the butter body cream, she started to cry. Gracie looked at me. Hormones, I said. Now we have to skip the climax of the story um, where it comes out that um, Tariq is actually gay and he and the narrator have this kind of bonding experience that gets them into trouble so they get grounded. Sorry. <laughs> By the time I could hang out again, it was the last few days of school and Ronnie, Gracie, and I were talking summer plans. Both of them had to make up classes. Ronnie had failed French and Gracie had failed PE, which you weren't even supposed to be able to do. But she'd skipped so many times, they were gonna make her come in during summer session and swim laps in the pool. I thought it was hilarious. Girl, you basically got a free pool this summer, I said. Can I get in or is it dumbass Puerto Ricans only? I saw a look flash between her and Ronnie. Nah, man, she said. I'm sure you could come by. It's not like they'll be supervising me real close. I was gonna go real early in the morning though, get it out of the way. Okay, I said, we can meet up afterwards. I'll, call, I'll come by the school when y'all are done and we'll walk to the mall. Yeah, said Gracie. I mean, unless you got something better to do. Ronnie looked at the ground. What's that supposed to mean, I said. I hated myself for asking. If you have to ask, you've already lost. People are saying that black kid who lives with you is a faggot, Gracie said. Whether my little brother is gay or not is his own business, I said. That's another thing, said Ronnie. Why call everybody your brother, your sister? They're just foster kids. They're not blood. Fuck you, I said. How do you know blood's so important? Did your jailed ass daddy teach you that or your alky grandma? Then I walked away. I almost wanted her to come running after me and smack me in the side of the head so we could get it out into the open, but Ronnie was too smart for that. She let me go. When I got home, Tariq had a nasty looking black eye. He wasn't crying though. He was getting tougher. It was three guys, he said. No way I had a chance, so I took it. It might get worse for a little bit, I said, holding a pack of frozen peas on his face. But if we lay low this summer, no one will even remember in the fall. But by the time school started, he was gone. He left one day while I was out of the house, didn't leave a note or anything, just a copy of the Avengers on my bed. I checked the paper for about a year. I never saw anything, which is a good sign, unless he went far enough away. 
A week ago, I was picking up the latest Ultimates with photos in the back of the artists at Comic-Con. In the captions, they thanked superfans, one of which had Tariq's same name. If I could ever manage to get the time off, I'd go next year, see if it was him. I made up with Ronnie a few days after the fight by taking her to the movies, my treat, but I could tell things were changing. I know I made it sound earlier like Ronnie, Gracie, and me were friends all the way through, but we weren't really. That summer, I spent more time reading comics with Tariq indoors or at the park, and less time with Ronnie and Gracie. And in 10th grade, even though Tariq was gone, we still hung out less and less. Ronnie got a boyfriend, the one who would knock her up two years later. And she'd come to school with her face glowing like a secret, like something she'd never dream of telling me. Gracie joined the school Chicana group and started giving out stickers with a half man, half jaguar on them, talking about pride and the struggle, like she thought I'd forgotten about those blue contacts. She looked at me sometimes with pity, like I couldn't possibly understand where she was coming from. And there's nothing I hate more than that kind of look, especially when we'd grown up in the same neighborhood, so close we could smell each other's shits. When Mr. Nunez, the Acción Latina faculty advisor, was fired in the middle of the semester, and Gracie was sent to live with her aunt in Provincetown for a few months, we realized she'd been keeping secrets too. And me? Girl, back then I had secrets even from myself. There were secrets on secrets, mysteries hiding behind other mysteries, things in the world I was just getting the first inklings of, just dark, warm dreams in the night, and sometimes a tickle in the corner of my eye like I just missed something leaping out of sight, something caped or masked, something booted or webbed or winged, something full of power, something I didn't know yet I could become. Thank you. has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.